when it happened was around 1600. That was the era of William Shakespeare in England, Galileo in Italy, and in Switzerland, a watchmaker named Jost Berge. He was actually more than a watchmaker. He was the instrument maker for the Royal Observatory there. He also helped with some of their mathematical calculations, and that often meant multiplying numbers with lots of digits. And after doing that for a lot of numbers, he had an idea how to make it easier. You know how it's really easy to multiply powers of 10 together, like 10 million times 1 million? You just count how many zeros and add, and that's how many zeros the result has. What if there were a way to do that for all numbers? What if each number you wanted to multiply had a special number that went with it, sort of like the number of zeros, so that you could multiply two numbers together just by adding the special numbers that go with them. That is the thing that our friend Yost figured out a way to do. To see how he might have gotten there, let's think about why counting zeros works for multiplying powers of 10. When you're counting zeros, what you're really doing is counting tens multiplied together, like this. If you have seven tens multiplied together, and multiply that by six more tens multiplied together, then you've multiplied 13 tens together in total. If you like math notation, it looks like this. So here's the thing. There's no reason we have to stick with the number 10. 10 is just convenient because the number of zeros tells you how many times 10 got multiplied together. But there are other ways of keeping track of that. For instance, you can make a table. What I did here was start with the number 1 and just keep multiplying by 3. So 1 times 3 is 3, and 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 3 is 27, and so on. And on the left, I just kept count. With a table like this, multiplying powers of 3 together is almost as easy as multiplying powers of 10 together. Say you wanted to do 27 times 243. Rather than counting zeros, we look up the two numbers in the table and add the numbers that go with them and see that the answer is 3 multiplied by itself 8 times, which the table tells us is 6561. They had tables like this in the 1500s. This was a table for the base 3, but they made them for other bit numbers too. They're not so useful since you can only multiply certain specific numbers with them. This is where our friend Yost comes in. Instead of multiplying by a whole number like 10 or 2 or 3, he multiplied by a number just fractionally bigger than 1, like this. The number he used was 1.0001, just 1 plus 1 ten thousandth. Just like in the other table, he kept count on the left. This way, the numbers on the right are much closer together, so that even if a number you want to multiply isn't exactly in the table, we can find one close by and still get an approximation. To keep it neat and consistent, Yas limited the numbers on the right to 9 digits. He called the ones on the left red, and called them the red numbers, but that's not what we call them today. It turns out that Yost wasn't the only guy thinking about these ideas around 1600. A Scottish nobleman named John Napier had pretty much the same idea. He didn't just call them the red numbers, he called them logarithms. So let's see if these logarithms are really any good. To keep it simple, let's pick two numbers between 1 and 10. 6.0833 times 5.4987. This works just like we did with the powers of 3. To look up the first number, we have to scroll down a bit and look for the closest number on the table. And we see that the approximate logarithm is 18,056. Now, I just want to stop here and point out how crazy it is the amount of work Yost had to do to make this table. He actually had to sit there with a quill pen and a bunch of paper and multiply by 1.0001 18,056 times just to get this far in the table. This was where the brute force came in. Anyway, the next number is a little earlier in the table. We add the two logarithms together and see that the approximate answer to our multiplication problem is whatever 1.0001 to the 35,102 power is. And to find that out, we scroll that much farther down in the table and see that the answer is approximately 33.449. How close is it? Pretty close. Definitely accurate enough to be useful and much faster than getting the same accuracy by hand. So his logarithms actually work. This magic of turning multiplication into addition is what makes logarithms logarithms. We've been using them for that ever since. We think about them a little differently now. Nowadays, we would call Yost's logarithms logs base 1.0001. And we make them more accurate by not just using whole numbers for the logarithms. We tend to use different bases now, too. Before calculators, lots of people used base 10 logs for multiplication problems. But mathematicians prefer logarithms to an unexpected base. You may know about this kind of log. They're called natural logarithms, and the base is a number a little bigger than 2.7 that people call e. e doesn't seem like a very natural base for a logarithm, but actually it kind of is. In fact, let's take a closer look at Jost Berge's original logarithms. First, I should tell you that his table was a little different than I showed you because he didn't know about a really handy bit of mathematical notation, the decimal point. 
So instead of starting with his table with 1.0 on the right, he started with 100 million. That way, he would still have nine digits of precision. He did know about fractions, so he could still multiply by one plus one th 10,000. He just wouldn't write that number with one decimal point. Another thing he did differently was to count by tens on the left and not ones. He didn't explain why he did that, but neither change had a big effect in how he used the logarithms. When he had a math problem involving multiplication, he would scale the number, numbers in the problem so that they were in the hundreds of millions, just like the numbers in his table. In the end, he would scale the answer back down. So, when he looked up the first number in the problem, instead of looking like this, it looked like this. All the digits are exactly the same. It's trickier keeping track of this thing if scaling numbers by 100 million, but his tables were still useful. We could scale the numbers differently and still stay within the spirit of Yost's logarithms. Let's go back to starting with one on the right-hand side, like we did to begin with. And, for the logarithms on the left, instead of scaling them up by a factor of 10, we could scale them down by a factor of 10,000, like this. This may seem kind of random, but it's actually a natural thing to do, because then, right at the start, the numbers on the right and the logarithms on the left are changing at the same speed. In the very first step, both of them go up by 0 .0001. This ties the two sets of numbers together in a way that makes sense even when the logarithms aren't whole numbers. But what kind of logarithms are these new ones? What's the base? So if you know about logarithms, you know that the base of the number is the number where the log of that number is 1. So log base 10 of 10 is 1, and log base 2 of 2 is 1. And in this table, log base 1.0001 of 1.0001 is 1. In this new table, though, we have to scroll down to see what number has a log equal to 1. But let's let Jost Burgi show us. On the front page, he had a sample of logarithms in a circle. This reproduction doesn't have them colored red, but the outer numbers are his logarithms. So we want to look at the, this one right here. So let's rotate and zoom in a little. This is still a little hard to interpret, so let's put decimal points in using the new scaling. This tells us that the log of about 2.718 is 1. So the base is approximately 2.718. But that's almost exactly e. In fact, Jost Berge's logarithms, if you tweak the decimal places like we did, are a really good approximation to natural logarithms. The other inventor, John Napier, same thing. His logarithms were an even better approximation. In the end, natural logarithms really are kind of natural after all.